Would you like to travel with What's Her Name podcast? In 2023, we're planning two trips focusing on the lost women of history. In June, we're going to France. And in October, we are going to New England. If either of these sound like your jam, check out our website, whatshernamepodcast.com. We are going to have an amazing time. This episode is supported by our Patreon supporters, Merav Epstein, Bo Yeager, Rachel Kay, Jessica Smith, Tracy Steeb, Kim Hokinson, Jan Elise Cannon, Jill Harrigan, Jamie Lang, Maria Carla Sanchez, Heather McKinnon, Valerie Jacobson, Eric and Carolyn Shumway, Chantel Oliver, Tamzane Weir, Caitlin McTaggart, and Lindsay Cummings. Hi, Katie. Hi, Olivia. What would you do if you weren't afraid? Ah. <laughs> um, I would enter small spaces. Ah. <laughs> I would maybe go to space. Hmm. Maybe. I've seen this question circulating around a bit. I think it's been appeared in a few self-help empowerment like books. Mm -hmm. I think it's a great question. Yeah. It's a great thought experiment. And it operates on several levels, right? Yeah. But I think it's a really good sort of fundamental gut check question about what's driving us. Like, mm. what would you do if you weren't afraid... In life. Of, uh, in life. Yeah. Of failure, mm. of um, disappointing yourself or others, of making a fool of yourself. I mean, there's so many things we're afraid of that we don't think about that way. Yeah. I love it. I think the story I am going to tell you today is the first life that I know of that I can point to that really feels like she might have lived her life that way. This woman lived the life that she would live if she wasn't afraid. Mm. Did she conquer her fear and do it in spite of fear? Or was she just literally fearless? And that's, of course, the question. And that's the main problem with doing history and women's history mm. in specific. That we have so few sources. But she genuinely doesn't seem to have known the meaning of fear. <laughs> the most stubbornly determined refusal to give in hmm. human being I've ever seen in my life. Wow. Cool. I'm Olivia Mickle. And I'm Katie Nelson. And this is What's Her Name? Fascinating women you've never heard of. What does a life lived without fear look like? It might look like this. After remaining two years here, I again started home. And on the way, my life and adventures were very nearly brought to a premature conclusion. Christmas Day had been kept very merrily on board our ship. And on the following day, a fire broke out in the hold. I did not lose my senses. But during the time when the contest between fire and water was doubtful, I entered into an amicable arrangement with the ship's cook, whereby in consideration of two pounds, which I was not, however, to pay until the crisis arrived, he agreed to lash me onto a large hen coop. Uh, what? <laughs> wow. This woman is on her way home from London, where okay. she has set up contracts with several major import agents to sell her stock of home-produced, high-demand products. What kind of products are we talking about? Pickles. Really? <laughs> yes. <laughs> cool. And jelly. Oh. Green tamarind pickles, pine marmalade, guava jelly. Wow, interesting. All kinds of exciting Caribbean products. Ah. Oh. Hand-preserved by her. Wow. 
She is a mixed race Jamaican woman who has just turned 18 and sailed off to London from her home in Kingston, Jamaica. Wow. Where she will continually ship more pickles, more marmalade, more jelly to these major London retailers. Wow. I love it. Also, it's 1821. <laughs> 1821 Kingston, Jamaica is like, it's, it's, there's probably still even pirates around. Oh, yeah, lots. Yep. This is an amazing overlap because that means that she lived in Jamaica when James Barry was <gasps> director of hospitals in hmm. the Caribbean. And she must have been in London when Harriet Mellon was ruling the stage. This is cool. Funny you should mention, because there's like at least six other overlaps coming by the way, in this episode. Ooh. Fun. And funny you should mention James Barry. Mm. Because the woman we're talking about today is named Mary Seacole. Ah, uh-huh. And she becomes most famous... As a nurse, nurse in the Crimean War. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Did they work together? We can't find any mention of them actually meeting, although he was in Jamaica in the 1830s. Interesting. When she would have been a young woman. He definitely knew of her no, existence. Gotta be. Yeah. But we can't find any meeting yet. But this whole story is one big detective story. Fascinating. Which is perfectly encapsulated in the title of the Mm. new book written by my guest, Helen Rappaport, In Search of Mary Seacole. My name's Helen Rappaport. I'm a writer and a historian specializing in the period from about 1837 when Queen Victoria came to the throne through to 1918 or thereabouts, the end of the Russian revolution and the takeover of the Bolsheviks. Mary Seacole is one of those people who is almost completely unknown in the U.S., more well-known in the U.K. In fact, Mm. she was voted Greatest Black Britain in 2003. Cool. She's kind of all over the internet these days, at least in my feeds. Yes, she's having a resurgence of popularity. But... Most of what's known about her is mostly wrong. Huh. And Helen Rappaport's research has made huge strides in what we know about her and how we can start to see her more clearly as an individual and a fully fleshed out human being and a really fascinating and powerful influence on global history of her time. Hmm. One of my objectives has been to find stories that have been forgotten or overlooked, particularly women's stories. And I think Mary Seacole in particular represents one of my longest running subjects in that it took me the best part of 20 years to dig out as much as I have done. Mary Seacole is, above all other things, a mystery. And as Hmm. Helen Rappaport points out, it's more like researching a cold case with a lot of reading between the lines and connecting dots from secondary or tertiary or other sideline sources. Brief mentions in letters. Why are there no records? Well, this is, of course, a problem when one is doing 19th century history that there's often a lot of material, lots of newspapers, lots of memoirs, The accuracy of those newspaper stories is (laughs) not to be taken at face value. Right. And there's a lot more legend than fact Mm. that you end up digging through. Fun. We do have a memoir written by Mary Seacole, and that is our primary source. Oh. The delightfully titled... The Wonderful Adventures of Mrs. Seacole in Many Lands. (laughs) Wow, I love that. It was a major bestseller. This is a memoir written for a very specific white Victorian audience. Hmm. It seems to be not dishonest, (laughs) but it's not particularly helpful. 
Hmm. In fact, most of the time it is what Helen Rappaport calls deliberately unhelpful. <laughs> it's not lying, but it is obscuring. Okay. She has lots of good reasons for hand-waving at a lot of things in her past. Hmm. For example, who are her parents? It's awful when you look at her memoir, you know, she opens it and says, oh, I was born with the century, okay. My father was a Scottish soldier. She doesn't even mention it. Well, she talks about her mother. She doesn't give us either of their names. The only reason we knew that her father was called Grant was that was her name when she got married. She was married as Mary Grant. And in Jamaica, illegitimate children took the name of the father. Because there were so many illegitimate mixed heritage children of military men out in Jamaica at the time. Mary was a typical product of those irregular relationships. She writing a memoir for a very shockable white Victorian audience. You don't start it by saying, you know, my mum and dad weren't married. Her father died early in her life. She romanticized him mm. to a huge extent. He was noble, he was fancy, and he yeah. is the thing which will give her social acceptance yeah. as the daughter of a white Scottish officer. Her mother was, well, here's the first big controversy. We know she was Jamaican, she was a woman of color. Mary never mentions her mother's name. She is just Mrs. Grant. Wow, that's interesting. For a long time, everyone had assumed using Mary's father's name, but after literal decades of research. I've done a massive amount of research with the help, I must credit her, of a wonderful genealogist in Jamaica. Anyway, between us, we figured out who I think the mother and father are. For me, it's a very important reveal because no one till I my book has come near to it. Her mother's name is Rebecca Grant, probably mixed race herself, something Mary alludes to a few times. And the most important thing we know about Rebecca is that she was a doctoress. And they developed their entire methodology and treatments and holistic medicines based largely on the natural pharmacopoeia that was available in Jamaica. And these doctresses were greatly underestimated and wonderful skills that were equivalent to any, those of any pharmacist of the time. So they're nothing to do with allopathic medicine and that at the time in the 1850s was heavily reliant on opium and laudanum and bleeding and purging and a lot of fairly injurious practices. These were medical practitioners, and they are the authorities on health in Jamaica, especially the local tropical diseases, which the British arriving have never encountered before and don't know anything about, including the British doctors. Hmm. I found one particular account by a British army doctor um, who'd been out in the West Indies, who'd seen the Jamaican doctresses at work, and who noticed how anyone who fell sick and went to the English army hospitals didn't do very well. But if the doctresses nursed them, they had a much better chance of recovery. Jamaican treatment for these diseases include herbal treatments that are actually fairly effective uh -huh. and have been being tested and tried for hundreds of years. So, we know almost nothing about her childhood. All we know is from her memoir, which breezes very quickly past most of it. So, I think it would be wise at this point to lay out the legend of Mary Seacole versus the reality of Mary Seacole. Okay. The legend of Mary Seacole says she is the nurse of all nurses. Starting hospitals, she's saving thousands of soldiers, she's a war hero, she is plowing onto the battlefield with the troops to save lives, and basically single-handedly saving humanity. <laughs> that 
Yeah, that's usually about what you see on the internet. And she's a wildly successful entrepreneur. She owns multiple hotels. She's running huge business concerns. Huh. Incredibly successful businesswoman. The reality is Mary Seacole never started a hospital. She never even worked in a hospital. She never oh. went to nursing school. She never qualified as what Britons would frame as nursing. She did not run hotels. She was not particularly influential in the field of nursing. She was a compassionate, idealistic, ambitious, fearless woman. She is a freewheeling maverick of the highest order. You cannot ever put her in a box at the time or in retrospect. Hmm. She will confound all of your categories. But she is consistently good. What kind of good? All the kinds of good. <laughs> and I think this is this is an interesting uh, flip side of the Halloween special that you just did mm. about the good nurse who was emphatically not. Ah, okay. Mary Seacole is the nurse who will rush in where angels fear to tread, treat the poor for free, sit by the bedside, doing everything she can to keep people alive. Mm. She really is that person that Huyumi is pretending to be. Interesting. But Mary Seacole is never taking out insurance policies on <laughs> any of the people that wow, she Wow, they is. even share a name. So me is Mary or yeah. Maria. So she's the real Huyumi. She's the real Huyumi. <laughs> wow. Mary Seacole is doing what she can to relieve suffering. And whether that is administering medicine or doing medical treatments or serving tea or changing bandages or cheering up the troops, all of those things are equally important to her. She mm. knows, she sees the value of medical treatment and the value of human compassion sitting by the bedside helping them write their last letters to their mothers. Like, she's doing the kind of really compassionate, human, personal nursing mm. that would be more likely to do, you would do for your family members, not in a hospital. So if she's never working for a hospital, like, is she just self-employed? And yes. Like, how is she having these wonderful adventures without being a nurse, you know, for the army? Or how is she just, like, sailing around the world doing what she wants? <laughs> By being utterly relentless. Hmm, <laughs> and cool. refusing to take no for an answer. But let's rewind a bit. Mary C. Cole seems like one of those people who have a calling from early in life. I was very young when I began to make use of the little knowledge I had acquired from watching my mother upon a great sufferer, my dog. And whatever disease was most prevalent in Kingston, be sure my poor doll soon contracted it. <laughs> she's mimicking her mother, but she's learning from her mother. She's kind of apprenticing yeah. at her mother's side, learning how to treat disease, but also how to treat people, even if they're dying, even if there's nothing you can do to save them. Your job is to relieve suffering. I can't help but make the connection to Doc McStuffins because <laughs> I have a young daughter. <laughs> Doc McStuffins <laughs> treats her stuffies because her mom is an actual doctor. Yeah. I'm just it's saying. Good practice. She catches the travel bug early. Mm -hmm. At 16 years old, she sets off for London, where she will not bore the reader with the details of her visit. <laughs> All right. This passage would have taken eight weeks sailing through. Granada, St. Vincent, Barbados, Portugal, and then to England. She stays about a year, says almost nothing about it, 
but she must have liked it because after one more year in Jamaica, she's off again to England to sell her pickles. I love it. She sees a gap in the market. She fills it. And these are wildly popular. I mean, like when I moved to England, it was back in the day when Oreos and Cheetos had not made their way to England at all. <laughs> and if I had known that and brought an inventory of Cheetos <laughs> and Oreos, I would have gotten rich. I should have thought more like Mary Seacole. She crossed the Atlantic at least nine times in her life. Wow. And she is just hopping around the globe every few years for the rest of her life. She's got that spirit of adventure, it seems like. She She's absolutely does. Seeking wonderful adventures. And she gets them. Hmm. She marries a man named Edwin Horatio Hamilton Seacole. Wow, fabulous. Amazing name. Mm -hmm. She nurses him through an illness. He proposes actual marriage, not the normal common law agreement. But this was clearly more of a pragmatic business deal. He is very ill and he needs someone to take care of him. And Mary is happy to do that. Hmm. And within one page of the memoir, Mary has married him and buried him. Ooh. <laughs> and she is now a fairly respectable, fairly wealthy widow. And here I may take the opportunity of explaining that it was from a confidence in my own powers and not at all from necessity that I remained an unprotected female. Indeed, I do not mind confessing to my reader in a friendly, confidential way that one of the hardest struggles of my life in Kingston was to resist the pressing candidates for the late Mr. Seacole's shoes. Oh, cool. She did not want a new husband. <laughs> ha! She liked her independence, and yes, she's going to keep it. Mm -hmm. She is running her boarding house. She is close friends with many British officers, and she has already sort of been appointed by them as Mother Seacole, their guardian angel, medical advisor, student friend. And my house was always full of invalid officers and their wives from Newcastle. Sometimes I had a naval or military surgeon under my roof from whom I never failed to glean instruction, given when they learned my love for their profession, with a readiness and kindness I am never likely to forget. She is learning from all of these surgeons that are staying in her boarding house who teaches her all kinds of medical and even a few surgical techniques, and they are cool. trading information. That's cool. And then in 1850, a massive cholera outbreak. Ah. Mary insists. 1850. Mm, they don't know what's causing it yet. No, they sure do not. And they're pretty sure that it's caused by miasma, its mm. smell. Yeah. Mary is pretty insistent that this is spread person to person and that smells don't matter. Mm. Neither one of those are right, but Mary's yeah. closer. Yeah. The epidemic kills a quarter of the population in Port Royal, kills one in eight people in Kingston. Dang. Up to 200 people a day are dying. Uh, oof. The town is dreadful in terms of sanitation. No sewers, no drains garbage swampy mm -hmm. sewer muck it breeds yellow fever dysentery but this is the first time that mary has seen cholera at this point the treatment for cholera is batley's sedative solution of opium okay or 20 drops of laudanum all right <laughs> and or calomel which is a mineral compound of mercurious chloride, mercury and chloride <laughs> mixed together. That'll do and it. it. Yeah, it is an extreme purging mm. treatment. Basically, it will give you terrible diarrhea. Now, these two are the kind of standard treatment for literally everything sure. in medicine at this point. Right. Get it out. With cholera, <laughs> especially, it's the worst possible choice. It 
dehydrates patients even more than normal and kills them really quick. Mm -hmm. But Mary Seacole is nursing people through the outbreak using her own method and innovating new techniques based on other tropical diseases she's been treating and watching her mother treat. Using especially what was called warming and rubbing. So Hmm. warming, you keep the patients really warm, put hot bricks at their feet. They're shivering, they're cold. You need to keep them very warm, which is actually extremely useful. Sure. And rubbing, which is basically massage Hmm. of the extremities to keep the blood flowing. Okay. This probably was actually helpful. And it definitely was not harmful, like the things the British doctors were doing. Mm. And then she's using her herbal pharmacopoeia, some useful, some not, but definitely helpful in terms of rehydrating patients, which might be the main key to keeping them alive. Sure. The outbreak ends, and she is unable to check her disposition to Rome any longer, in her own words. <laughs> I know and that she feeling, decides. Mary. <laughs> And she decides she's off to Panama. Okay. All right. Now, her brother, Edward, is in Panama. He has gone to seek his fortune and had written back that he had established a considerable store and hotel. Mm. She heard there's money to be made, food and accommodation, and medical care. Okay. So she couldn't resist the challenge, and off she goes. Is it fearless? Is it foolhardy? Is it mm. just it's a spirit wonderful of adventure? adventure? Is what it is. Panama, that was the absolute equivalent of the Wild West. The Isthmus of Panama in the early 50s, when they were just beginning to build the railroad, where Panama was full of gun toting Yankee gold prospectors doing the shortcut. You know, they're going down the isthmus to Panama City and up to California for the gold rush from 1848 onwards. Really dangerous, infested with disease and creepy crawlies and crocodiles and God knows what. And she just, I have this image of her striding off in her crinoline and her bonnet and getting in a bongo boat and going down the Chagres River. I mean, she was an amazing woman. Nothing scared her. Lots of formerly enslaved people from the U.S. are making their way to Panama to work on the railroad. She thinks it's going to be a grand adventure and a rare opportunity. And when she arrives, she is pretty shocked at what she finds. The word that people use over and over again to describe this part of Panama at this time is pestilential. (laughs) She gets off the boat and is just flabbergasted by what she is confronted with. It is not an encouraging start to her journey to get off the boat and see men dying from sheer exhaustion Mm -hmm. on the side of the road. She makes herself useful for a few days there, nursing people straight off the boat and eventually finally makes it to her brother's hotel. I pressed on to the independent hotel, eagerly anticipating the comforts which awaited me there. At length, we reached it. But rest, warmth, comfort, miserable delusions. Her brother's so-called hotel is a ramshackle mess of a shack. (sighs) where she learns that she and her maid will be sleeping under the table while her brother sleeps on top. This is a very exciting, dramatic, Wild West town. Fights, Mm -hmm. crime, shootouts, and lots of disease. Yellow fever and malaria, typhoid, dysentery, smallpox, hookworm, pneumonia, respiratory infections. Also... Snakes, spiders, lethal scorpions, alligators. <laughs> no, thank you. All of this no leads thanks. to an average death rate of 40% among railroad workers. And she's experiencing racism here like she has never experienced in her life. She is forced to hire her own boat 
rather than travel with a group of white Americans who are going exactly the same place because they have made their opinion of her very clear. I have a few shades of deeper brown upon my skin, which shows me related, and I am proud of the relationship, to those poor mortals whose bodies America still owns. And having this bond and knowing what slavery is, is it surprising that I should be somewhat impatient of the airs of superiority which many Americans have endeavored to assume over me? Mind, I am not speaking of all. I have met with some delightful exceptions. She is there for two days before a traveler in her brother's hotel dies. She takes one look at the body and diagnoses cholera. Uh -uh. Here we go again. People start dropping like flies. She starts treating people with mustard and chloride, which is awful, but was kind of the standard treatment. And she discovers that she is, for all intents and purposes, the only medical practitioner in the entire area. Mm -hmm. She's the only hope for these people. There is no one. She treats the poor for free and charges hefty fees to treat the rich. She has seen cholera before, and she's doing her best, but people are still dying at horrific rates. She's trying new things. She's innovating. She's using her brain and her curiosity. And she's coming up with new treatments. Cinnamon water probably helped, a good rehydration. And probably the most helpful thing she did was her insistence on cleanliness, sanitation, ventilation. Mm. She and James Berry are both on team clean up this mess. <laughs> and she is horrified by the, the treatments that sick people are being left in. Mm. Dozens of people shoved into a tiny little dark barn unventilated and she will not have it. Yeah. And then she catches cholera herself. Ah. Uh. It's a close thing, but she eventually recovers. And of course, now she has firsthand experience, which makes her even more empathetic. Yes, she caught cholera and recovered, thankfully, but she do, you don't get a sense of her being afraid at all, just doing, getting on with things. And she identifies a gap in the market. So she opens her own hotel across the road from her brother. Hotel, in major quotes, the British Hotel is a canteen. <laughs> it has two private rooms for lady travelers or for the sick, but it is not a hotel. She offers simple meals, four shillings for dinner, which is probably pancakes and jerk pork, extra for eggs or chicken. But this is where part of the legend comes that she, she is famed as a hotel runner. She never runs a hotel outside of Jamaica, ever. But she huh. keeps naming things the British Hotel. Okay. She stays several years, nurses people through a couple of epidemics, but finally cannot take the crime and squalor anymore and finally decides it's time to go home. She announces her departure, and many of the people who she has nursed through illness or have become friends in her time there throw her a goodbye party. But even as they are celebrating her and honoring her, they're degrading her. At her farewell party, thanking her for her service to the people of Cruces, an American man who she had nursed and saved commiserates with her publicly in a speech that it's too bad that God had not seen fit to make her fully white nor American <laughs> so that she might be both <laughs> accepted and acceptable. <sighs> He announces to the room, if we could bleach her by any means, we would. <laughs> he right. clearly thinks he is paying her an yeah. extreme compliment. Her response is an epic burn, as my children would have said several years mm -hmm. ago. As to the society which the process might gain me admission into, all I can say is that Judging from the specimens I have met with here and elsewhere, I don't think that I shall lose much by being excluded from it. 
So, gentlemen, I drink to you and the general reformation of American manners. Oh, yes. Yes. <laughs> Amazing. And she arrives in Kingston just in time for the yellow fever outbreak. Oh, good. Immediately straight back into nursing. The white officers are being absolutely massacred by this. And despite all of the terrible suffering she had seen in the previous cholera epidemics in Jamaica and Panama, Mary found this yellow fever epidemic in 1853 more difficult to bear than any she had previously borne a part in. It was a terrible thing to see young people in the youth and bloom of life suddenly stricken down, not in battle with an enemy that threatened their country, but in vain contest with a climate that refused to adapt them. And this gives her a chance for a covert swipe at the colonial system itself. Indeed, the mother country pays a dear price for the possession of her colonies. And, as is her pattern, as soon as the epidemic is over, she is off again. She heads back to Panama to settle up some loose ends, sell off her hotel, Edward is not interested in running it anymore, and she suddenly sets off for Escribanos, which is an area in Panama of such dense rainforest that there is no overland route. She has to take a tiny boat all along the coast, and she becomes a gold miner. Uh, what? <laughs> wow. She is invited by the superintendent of the Fort Bowen Mine, who she says is a distant connection of her late husband. And by her own admission, Mary succumbs to the lure of gold fever. Ah! Okay. She heads off into the rainforest, hoping to make her fortune. But it doesn't last long. And within a few months, she heads back to Britain via a quick stop in Jamaica. Because England has declared war on Russia. The press have been full of horrific tales of the suffering and disease plaguing British war hospitals in the area. And she decides it's time for her to turn her hand to wartime nursing. The Crimean War in 10 seconds or less. <laughs> Essentially, Russia had invaded Crimea and England went to stop them. Uh huh. The British commanders had promised their soldiers that this would be a short and victorious campaign. How many times have we heard this line? Oh, sure. And so the troops had been sent out under-equipped without enough of anything. Tents, supplies, food, medicine, doctors, nurses. Soldiers are suffering disease, starvation, cold, misery. Mary is appalled by these reports. She knows that her years of nursing the sick through cholera and yellow fever and other diseases have perfectly equipped her for this task. And she reads in the papers that a woman has been selected to organize the effort of getting nurses over to Crimea. That woman's name is Florence Nightingale. I never stayed to discuss probabilities or enter into conjectures as to my chances of reaching the scene of action. I made up my mind that if the army wanted nurses, they would be glad of me. And with all the order of my nature, which ever carried me where inclination prompted, I decided that I would go to the Crimea. And go I did, as all the world knows. She's rejected everywhere. She makes the rounds of everyone and anyone who might empower her to go. Ugh. Trying to persuade them that she could be useful, but no one will even let her in the door. Ugh. And the awful irony, I guess, 
of Mary not being hired by the British authorities or any other black women for that matter, because at least a couple of other black women did apply to go out and join Florence Nightingale. The stupid thing was that these West Indian nurses were skilled in dealing with precisely the things that were felling the troops. Dysentery, cholera, enteric disease, diarrhea. Cholera was rife. These West Indian nurses had a tremendous practice in dealing with fevers and those kind of diseases, which was exactly what the British should have been hiring them for. If they had any brains. Maybe she had false hope because of her friendly relations with the doctors and military officers in Kingston. But these men are actively asking for skilled nurses. And yet they leave her sitting in the hall for hours and won't even give her the courtesy of an interview. Ah! Mary is not one to be stopped by a mere imperial government, (laughs) as the world is about to discover. She is going to get there, even if she has to do it all herself. Mary sets off by herself on a steamer for Constantinople. She meets a Turkish officer there who helps her set up a supply chain because... She is heading to the front lines of one of the most infamously terrible war zones in history to start a store. (laughs) Cool. She sent out a little business card and it was picked up by the press saying, oh, we've heard that um, a Mr. Seacole is going to set up a restaurant. And they assumed it had to be a man. It couldn't possibly be a woman going to a war zone to set up a restaurant and officers' court as well. That was her intention. She grandly announced that she was going to set up the British Hotel. What she originally planned was to do is sort of set up a kind of convalescent hotel for sick officers recovering before they went home and also have a storehouse and a canteen for the lower ranks. But the British authorities wouldn't allow her to run the hotel. The business card says Mrs. Seacole. But of course, this was so unheard of that the newspapers still assumed she was a man. No woman will be jumping straight into a war zone with no affiliation or official standing. That would be absurd. But there she is, three miles away from the battlefield, the British Hotel. Wild. Again. (laughs) she'll be selling provisions for the military and running a canteen for regular soldiers and a restaurant style experience for wealthy officers and for the tourists who would come to watch the war over dinner (laughs) Mary Seacole hired two cooks and she cooked herself she was famous for her pastry And she's nursing in a small way. She has a drop-in clinic. She's treating the walking wounded. The nickname she's often given is the Black Florence Nightingale. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Now, this is wrong for a whole legion of reasons. Mm -hmm. Most especially because, as Helen Rappaport points out, she is no more the Black Florence Nightingale than Florence is the White Mary Seacole. They are not doing the same thing at all. So people lump them together because we have two famed nurses in the Crimean War. Like, yes, is, that's it. OK, that's it. Here we have, of course, the one slot problem rearing its head again. There is only room for one nurse in all of human history, but especially in Crimea. OK. So Mary is serving tea to the sick and the wounded who are waiting for ships to Scutari Hospital. She's bandaging men at the docks. In her canteen, she is handing out food and medical treatment. But she's never official at any level here. She is just filling in and, as always in her life, making herself useful. And she is relentlessly useful no matter who tries to stop her. When I searched among hundreds and hundreds of 
letters and diaries written by the officers in Crimea, mainly, so many of them were saying that when the soldiers had a dose of dysentery or stomach upset, they went to Mary for her pomegranate astringent drinks and treatments because they were more effective. They trusted her better than they did the army doctors because it became well known in Crimea that if you were sent on the boat across to Scutari, you didn't have much chance of surviving. And that wasn't Florence's fault. It was just that the sepsis and cross infections were rife at Scutari, whereas soldiers nursed in the field hospitals on the Crimean plain had a better chance of getting over it. And Mary also, of course, having from her years in Panama, she could stitch a knife wound, she could extract a bullet, you know, she knew how to deal with cases of frostbite. Wasn't really anything that didn't, that phased her. Sometimes she is even heading out onto the battlefield to treat the wounded at the end of a battle. I bound up the wounds and ministered to the wants of a good many and stayed there some considerable time. And even here, I was under fire. More frequently than was agreeable, a shot would come ploughing up the ground and raising clouds of dust or a shell whiz above us. Upon these occasions, those around would cry out, Lie down, mother, lie down! And with very undignified and unladylike haste, I had to embrace the earth and remain there until the same voices would laughingly assure me that the danger was over. Several times in my wanderings on that eventful day, I was ordered back, but each time my bag of bandages and comforts for the wounded proved my passport. She's doing a roaring trade. She charges the officers good money for food and wine in her restaurant and uses that money to aid the poor and feed the regular soldiers for free. Ah. She's known as Mother Seacole or Auntie Seacole. They are sending letters home praising her to the skies. The extraordinary thing was the huge regard, admiration and affection with which all the white soldiers referred to Mary. They really did love her and admire her and were intensely grateful for all that she did for her generosity, for this wonderful spirit, this ability to comfort and provide succor and medicines in the middle of a war zone. There was enormous affection for her. For you see, war, like death, is a great leveler and mutual suffering and endurance had made us all friends. In November, December 1855, she's nursing sick men, selling goods, running the restaurant. And this period of time, as the war is winding down, but the soldiers are still there, is the best for her. She's catering fancy race meetings, ah, Christmas puddings, holiday meals, charging huge prices to make up for the food and medicine she's been giving away during the entire war. And these officers can afford all of it. And then the men start being shipped home. And quite a few of these men, these officers who have sung her praises and who credit her with saving their lives and their sanity, leave without paying their bills. Ugh! She has incurred all of these huge debts, buying all this food, medicine, and they all owe her money. She's been running huge tabs for them. And many of them leave without paying what they owe. And she is bankrupted. Mm. She returns to the UK, hoping to recoup some of those debts, but totally fails. But the people of England greet her as a hero. In fact, they throw a huge fundraiser festival when she arrives. Ah! There have been reports of her financial troubles in the newspapers, poems written on her behalf. And so at the time she launches her memoir, this massive event kicks off. 
Over a thousand artists performed, 11 military bands, orchestras, celebrities, 40,000 people pay to attend this event. Wow. And she is reveling in it. This event raises so much money. Cool. And Mary gets 57 pounds of it. Uh, what? <laughs> wow. Corruption and incompetence combine, and she makes nearly nothing out of this huge event. Ugh. Now, the press were furious about this missing money. They ran tons of stories about it. My favorite headline, Mother Seacole attacked by wolves. They are clamoring for her to have her money restored. Okay. And while she doesn't get that money back, lots of others chip in, including the Queen and the Prince of Wales. Wow. Who become her patrons. She doesn't seem to care much about the money except as a means to continue her work. And then she announces to the press that she is about to head off to India to nurse in the Indian Rebellion. Cool. Give me my needle and thread, my medicine chest, my bandages, my probe and scissors, and I'm off, she said. And there are lots of other women ready to follow her. Wow. But the secretary of the East India Company has already put the dampers on this plan from the beginning. Mary knows this, and she is sending letters to friends in the war office anywhere else high up in the government begging to be allowed to go. But this is not like Crimea. This is an established British colony, and she cannot just go set up shop like she did last time. Mm. Over in Jamaica a few years later, Mary's sister Louisa reported to the writer Anthony Trollope, who was her guest at the boarding house. My sister wanted to go to India, but Queen Victoria would not let her. Her life was just too precious. <laughs> and so Mary is knocking around England for a while, heads back to Panama, then back to Jamaica. Then the newspapers announce she is opening a store in Panama City. There, if we are to believe the account of a young Scottish sailor named William, she had been unfortunate in a matrimonial relationship oh. with a man who bolted with a portion of her pecuniary means. But William reported that her heart appears to be whole and that she had a short sword hanging ready at hand, which she can handle expertly if any troublesome customer attempt to annoy or rob her. <laughs> so Mary Seacole's still very much in form. But her funds are gone again, and she cuts her losses and heads back to Jamaica. Mary decides to return to England again, where she discovers that homeopathic medicine is all the rage, and she fits in very nicely with this, starts offering her homegrown remedies, and her pharmaceutical skills are called on in another outbreak of cholera in 1866 in London. Mm. In 1876, she's back to Jamaica again. Then back to England. She's bouncing back and forth. Wow, she's just buzzing around the world, connecting to everybody. Finally, in 1881, a modest announcement of Mary's death was published in London on May 14th. She died of apoplexy. This is probably a stroke. Mm hmm. And her obituary in the Times was syndicated across 30 regional and colonial papers across the globe and announced that the deceased will be remembered for greatly distinguishing herself as a nurse on the battlefield during the Crimean War. Wow. She would have loved this. But then she is fairly quickly forgotten. Mary, unlike Florence Nightingale, didn't have a paper trail, didn't have a written legacy. She didn't publish books on nursing. She didn't set up nurses' training. So Mary's reputation largely rested on that slim memoir she wrote, and also mainly on people's memory of her, people who'd known her in Crimea. 
the ordinary soldiers. And so her memory and knowledge of Mary was kept alive orally. They did talk about her and they passed things on and shared memories. And as all the old veterans died, in that way, Mary's story got lost. But she has recently come roaring back, if not accurately. But this book might be the thing that finally brings her back. Helen Rappaport's book is wonderful. It captures this complicated, uncategorizable woman in a way that seems nearly impossible. Because Mary C. Cole defies our pigeonholing. She saved countless lives. She eased the suffering of countless more. She saw the world in a way that is almost unimaginable for her time. Yeah. And she lived 100% on her own terms, creating and recreating herself over and over and over again. Hers is an utterly fearless, utterly astonishing life that I haven't been able to stop thinking about since I first started researching this episode. She is truly one of a kind. Unless I am allowed to tell the story of my life in my own way, I cannot tell it at all. Huge thanks to Helen Rappaport. If you'd like to learn more about Mary Seacole or see any of Helen's other brilliant books, check our website at whatshernamepodcast.com. There you'll find links, photos, resources, and more. You can also follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, where we post lots of photos each week. If you enjoyed this episode, we encourage you to leave a review on iTunes or wherever you listen to your podcasts. It's the best way for us to reach more people. And if you'd like to help support more women's history and more episodes of this podcast, please visit our website at whatshernamepodcast.com and click donate. Our theme song was composed and performed by Daniel Foster Smith. What's Her Name is produced by Olivia Mickle and Katie Nelson. And this episode was edited by Olivia Mickle.